morning and welcome. It is Thursday night. This is Paranormal IRL. I'm your host, JV, along with my pudgy Italian uncle, Britt. Welcome to the program. But what do you what do you mean? Did you say hey? Did you, you hey, know? hey, <laughs> hey. Okay, that's a little better. That's a little better. Uh, welcome to the program, everybody. Yeah. We, we've got a great show. Normally, we uh, we, we talk very, very ser- seriously about uh, many different topics, but generally, we have people on who have had a very personal experience related to one of the topics, whether it's UFOs, ghosts. Uh, We have psychics on the program. We've got time travelers on the program, a whole myriad of people on the program. Often we have Bigfoot experiencers on the program tonight, and they tend to tell a very serious story about their encounter with the uh, hairy seven foot to 10 foot creature we know know as Sasquatch or Bigfoot or Brit standing on a soapbox. Um, but either way, uh, hey, the, hey. The, <laughs> the, the stories are tend to be tend to be rather serious. Tonight we're going to take a different approach. Uh, we're going to be talking to a filmmaker who has created a movie called Elusive. He uh, it's self self titled a stupid Bigfoot movie. It's it's a mockumentary, and if you're familiar with that style of filmmaking, it's presented in a documentary format. But it's not really a documentary. It's it's tongue in cheek. There are jokes. There are spoofs. And this film does that. And I think it's a great approach to looking at this particular topic because the whole Bigfoot conversation, Britt, you and I have talked about it on many occasions. We have hundreds of years of reports of this giant seven to ten foot creature running around the woods of North America. Yet the evidence, when we talk about we need to see some evidence is scant yeah we don't get good well, pictures I watched this movie we don't we don't get good pictures we don't, a lot of evidence we don't get good pictures we don't get good uh dna samples we've never found a corpse at least not one that wasn't fake uh you know there are so many reasons why <laughs> people are very skeptical of this although there are very many many people who swear on their lives on their children's lives that they've experienced this creature and i i think at best the jury's out but it's fun to step back do you remember on ghost hunters brit when uh jay and grant were spoofed in south park Oh, it's hilarious. I mean, Jay was afraid of everything, including the lighter, and then he shit himself. It was awesome. Yeah, yeah. It was a great moment for ghost hunters because uh, they, you know, they've got the South Park writers got to poke fun at it a little bit. I was watching an episode of Rift Tracks. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Rift Tracks. It's it's the same guys oh, that did that? Mystery Science Theater 3000, and they have a oh. new thing they do called That's- Rift Tracks. Same thing. They just don't have the the silhouettes on the screen like uh, Mystery Science Theater did. And it, and in the in the uh, in the uh, episode of Rift Tracks, they're doing their spoof. They're doing their spoof, and they and they get to this long part of this movie where like nothing's happening. And one of the guys says, as his spoof, as his joke says, "Wow, this is this is more boring than a marathon of ghost hunters." I mean, so he, he makes he makes fun of it too. So the fact that we can take a step back and actually make fun of some of these things and and kind of have a laugh at it, that's yeah. important too. But I also think there's some important messages here in this film, at least some things that you can tell. Walk away with uh, and actually feel as though you you you, you kind of got a new perspective on things. In fact, they say uh, in the trailer, um, "Come for the uh, Bigfoot jokes and stay for the daddy issues." So we'll have uh, the filmmaker <laughs> Nick Sanford explain that to us in a minute. Before we go there, though, I want to um I want to talk about something I came across in the news. And by the way, welcome to everybody who's filing in to all of the chat rooms. We appreciate you joining us here tonight. It's great to see you all. And uh, we really do appreciate the effort that you take to get here. But this story uh, came across, uh, you know, the the news the other day. And I, I just saved it because I thought it was so very interesting. Yeah, we've talked about vampires, but Megan Fox says that she and Oh, look at those cleavage. She and her fiance I, mean, I knew you'd go right there. She and her fiance Machine Gun Kelly drink each other's blood, Brit. That's how dedicated they are to each other. They take a moment now and then and drink each other's blood. That's quite a relationship, don't you think? Uh that uh I mean that is like there are so many inappropriate jokes I'm refraining from on this show. But if this was BBB, I would be unloading on all of the spit jokes I could come up with. But I, I, Megan Fox, wasn't she the one that was in like Transformers or something? Yeah, stuff Transform- like that? yeah absolutely. Transformers. Yeah, absolutely. Transformers. Yep. And the one that she got fired from that because she was too difficult to deal with. I and mean, she's a Disney kid, right? Uh, that I'm not sure of. Now you're beyond my pay grade when it comes to this stuff. 
But that is, that is insane. I mean, I live here in Hollywood, and I'm pretty sure the Hollywood people that I, that I work on their homes would, would say that's insane. I don't understand that. That is a mental illness. But, you know, some of the best actors and actresses are mentally ill. Yeah, and I think that's yeah. how they're able to slide in and out of their characters because, yeah. you know, it's just another personality within their head. But, wow. Yeah. You know, and in that photo, was his tongue black? Uh, I don't know. Is that can, tattooed? Uh, let me see if we can see his tongue in this thing. Can you see it? I guess. Is that what this, that is? The, in the one to the right. In the inset? Let me see if that, I can blow that up Are they up licking a each bit. other? Let me blow that up and see if we can. It looks like he's got a black tongue. Let's see if we can see it a little better. Yeah, that's a black tongue. Is that tattooed? Uh, Did he tattoo his tongue black? Oh, uh, man. Sure looks like he may have. The rest of his body seems tattooed, so... Huh. Um, let me read a couple quotes wow. here. So Megan, Megan Fox says, uh, I guess drink each other's blood is a little misguided or is misguiding people or people are imagining, imagining us with goblets and we're like Game of Thrones drinking each other's blood. Um, she said, but no, it's just a few drops. And yes, we do consume each other's blood on occasion for ritual purposes only. Ritual purposes only? What ritual are we talking about here? Which one? Oh, they're doing they're doing Satanism. Is that what you think it They're is? They're doing Satanism. Oh, God, yeah. That's totally, God. that's got to be, that, that. either that or it's the new woke cult religion. I don't know which, but yeah. um, But I haven't heard any of the woke people drinking each other's blood, but that sounds like the, the Satanism or, I mean, because the only way that these, the only way that she would still be in Hollywood is if she's doing some kind of voodoo, hocus pocus, ritual Satanist stuff to uh, put curses on people to get, to get jobs. Really? I think, I think I mean, the, she's beautiful the and picture, all, but yeah, the man, picture she kinda, someone else's yeah, paying the ass. The picture kind of tells you why she's still in Hollywood. But uh, she also says it's used <laughs> to, it's used for a reason, and it's controlled where it's like, uh, let's shed a sh few drops of blood and drink it. Uh, he's much more haphazard and hectic and chaotic than I am, where he's willing to just like cut his chest open with broken glass and be like, take my soul. Let me bleed on you. All right, this is getting this is getting really kinky. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, this sounds like this is a this is a fetish. See, this is what happens. So Megan Fox is super rich already at a young age uh, from her acting because she was in some hit films. Machine Gun Kelly's obviously got uh, he's either super rich, but this is what spoiled people do. This is what people that they <laughs> they, they they have too much money and not enough things to, for them to 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 sink their teeth into stuff that fulfills them. So they start doing weird shit like this. I mean, this is next level weird. Yeah. Oh, we got to make a documentary about this. I wonder if they would let us film them doing it. Yeah, uh, that would be really cool. That would be really neat. Uh, let's get let's get our guests. I'm take. down. With I want to get our guest take on this. Nick, uh, you've been around people who make movies. Welcome to the program. Do you see a lot of people drinking each other's blood on the on the set or what? Hang on a sec. Uh, I've done a few stand-up shows where that was going on in the bathroom, but not anything related to uh, you know movies or, or any of that. No. What, in the bathroom, really? they drink each other's blood. Oh no, I, I, I was just, I was just kidding. Yeah, oh, okay, no, no, right, no, no, right. No, 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 no. <laughs> all right. Uh, by the way, I, I have... wear, I'm wearing khaki pants right now. I've never seen anyone drink anyone else's blood. It's very, very boring life. I have, uh, I have to commend you on your choice of T-shirt and the poster over your right shoulder. Uh, you clearly oh, yeah. are a horror movie fan. And uh, those mm -hmm. are two of my favorite. I, I think if like when people ask me one of my top favorite horror films, those two are probably number one and number two, and I'm not sure which one is which. Exorcist was probably a little above The Shining for me personally, but um, no, they're both great for different reasons. Yeah, I don't know if you if you know anything about me, probably not. But I run a, a horror convention called Scaricon. Uh, it stopped mm -hmm. with the pandemic, but we were 12 years uh, running in upstate New York and in Massachusetts. And so I'm very familiar with, with not only the films themselves, but a lot of the people involved in making them. And I understand your first film or one of the first films you made was a horror film, right? That's mainly what I made. Yeah. Um, yeah. Elusive is one of the only like comedy comedies that I've that I've done. But yeah, it's it's mainly been horror stuff. All right. So you're locked down uh, pandemic lockdowns. Everybody's miserable because you can't do anything, can't go anywhere. All your restaurants and bars are closed. You're not supposed to see your friends. You're barely supposed to see your family. So you decide to make a movie. 
pretty there's another thing that we have been working on for a couple of years bigger much more expensive project and uh pandemic hit and it's like well this isn't happening for several years now what else can we do and um yeah we just wanted wanted something that we could kind of all pull our money into something that would be quick and cheap and and all that and we um we committed to doing it in may of 2020 and we were shooting by november so tell me how you chose this particular topic have, first of all let me ask you this have you had an experience whether it's bigfoot or some other paranormal experience personally i don't think so i mean i'm fairly open to a lot of that but, you know especially like Ghosts and aliens are, you know, the two, I mean, I, you know, that's, that's, that's some, that's some shit I could get into, but, um, as far as Bigfoot goes and just general cryptozoology stuff that really started for me when I was like 13, um, uh, I saw signs for the first time, you know, the M. Night Shyamalan movie and it was just yeah. perfect age to see that movie. And it got me into like alien, you know, aliens led to Bigfoot and all that. And so I'd always wanted to make a Bigfoot movie and we actually shot a short film of elusive, um, several years ago now and it's not perfect i mean it, there's a lot of good jokes in it and stuff like that but it was it was a little wonky and uh, uh the editor of that who andrew mcdonald who also edited and co-wrote um this feature version this this new feature version when we were making that we were always like man you know i wish we could have done this different and that different and that you know and so when the pandemic rolled around and we were looking for something quick and cheap to shoot um that was just perfect you know it was mainly outdoors and and all that so so the bigfoot legend the bigfoot history how much did of that did you get into i mean how much research did you have to do when you started putting this project together uh i think andrew watched a lot of just more aesthetically he watched a lot of the like, travel channel documentary series you know all the, the 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 goofy things of the guys you know the crazy rednecks out in the woods looking for yeah, bigfoot and all yeah, that yeah that was i mean that was about as far it's funny you say that because we really just kind of made up like all the bigfoot mythology that's in the movie um all the weird powers that bigfoot may or may not have we just kind of made a lot of that up and we've sort of found after the movie has come out and you know we actually really started looking into this stuff that we weren't that far off from what a lot of people say about you, you were know, that he he can control your brain and he can like do all this weird say i mean it's very strange because we thought we were just being silly and goofy but um but no apparently that's that's what a lot of people really believe i'm, I'm trying to remember there's basically like two bigfoot camps uh, you know the people that think he's just a uh, just a regular flesh and creature, blood. Yeah. and then the one, yeah, and then the ones that think he, you know, there there are like supernatural power, and they're like name those, and I, can't, I, I the other day and I already forgot, but um, but yeah, yeah, I guess we were a lot closer than we meant to. We were just making a stupid Bigfoot movie, but um. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to ask you another question. I'll let Britt take it for a few minutes here. But uh, as I uh, introduced the film and the idea in the opening of the show here, I said uh, in the trailer, it says, come for the Bigfoot jokes, stay for the daddy issues. What are we talking about? Yeah. Here? What, what are we talking about here? Uh, yeah. So I had just become a father uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. Perfect time to, to you know, go on the uh, existential roller coaster known as parenthood. Um, and so a <laughs> lot of it was just kind of, a lot of it was just kind of writing about that and kind of, you know, like, like figuring out, you know, okay, I've got a, I've got a son now. What does that mean? You know, it's, it's a crazy for anyone that, you know, has kids. I mean, it just totally changes everything. And, um, yep. and so, so the movie kind of became about, you know, uh, uh, a, a, a a father's relationship to his son. He's out looking for Bigfoot for his for his son uh, without you know spoiling too much. And a lot of it came whenever we cast Brad Chad as Wayne as you know in in the lead. He's a little bit older than I am. He's in his mid forties, I think, and he's got two sons that are just about full grown and he's the one who really took it and like you know was having a conversation through his performance and all that about um 
about, you know, your, uh, your relationship to your kids and all that. And, um, and so a lot of that came from him. And then the tagline itself, come for the Bigfoot joke, stay for the father issues. That was just, I think that was Andrew McDonald's idea that, um, about, you know, cause we were like, what's the perfect tagline that sums the thing up, you know, absolutely. And he came up with that and I was like, that's it. We're leading with that. That's, that's what the movie is now. You know, that's, that's what we're doing. So. Well, that's pretty cool. Um, so it's kind of funny. You you had a movie, a young age movie experience that opened you up to that stuff. I was 11 years mm -hmm. old, and now I'm way older than you. And my cousins, I was 11, they were 16, 17, and 19, took me to see Alien, the original, oh, at 11 years old. Yeah. And then they got me drunk and stoned and put me in the third row to watch that movie. I didn't want anything to do with any aliens for like years after that. I was terrified. So, but I do have yeah. a question. So the big, so the Bigfoot that you cast in your movie. So this is the original photo. I took this from your website. This is the one from mm -hmm. uh, what was uh, the from Patterson, what, Patterson like, 40, it? Was this? Yeah, what is this? This is like sixty years ago, JB. Uh, uh, Seventy uh, years I think ago. Sixty-eight, wasn't it? Sixty-seven 68, or sixty-eight. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so almost almost eighty years ago, or thereabouts. So is this Brent, the how can you, you come cast, up with all, did you, how can you come up with eighty years ago? <laughs> Wouldn't it be Well, if it's sixty, that's forty, right? And twenty. Okay, so it's about sixty five years ago. No, it's maybe fifty. Right? Maybe fifty five. Maybe fifty five or fifty four. Fifty five. Yeah. Fifty four years. I, I don't know. I, I'm in the zone. I'm close ish. Come on. Yeah, you're within a Jeez. century. Anyway. You're within a century. It's good. I'm within a century. Yeah. That that hey, in the in the realm of Bigfoot history, I'm pretty close. Anyway, my question is: So, it, the Bigfoot in your movie is this? A, is this like a son or a grandson, or uh, is it actually this? Uh, is it the original Bigfoot that was documented sixty years ago? Uh, so that Bigfoot, you know, the image, the classic, you know, Patterson Gimlin image that like everyone knows. We use that at the beginning to kind of set a baseline, uh, you know, for expectations for you know, because it's just it's the easiest. You know, I, I guess the word would be intertextuality. You see that, you immediately get a feeling. You get a sense of what, you know, like, oh, this is Bigfoot, you know, this is whatever. And it's kind of like the classic myth of of Bigfoot. You know, it'd be like seeing, you know, the first uh, action comics where Superman is lifting up the car or whatever. You know, it's just right. the thing that, like, it's the most, you know, recognizable image. And so we start the movie with that, um, you know, just as, like, a piece of, you know, photo evidence or whatever, you know, just, just so people like kind of, you know, can kind of slip into the mythology of it. Um, and then when we do our reenactments, uh, it's just a guy in a shitty gorilla costume and it's supposed to kind of like pull the rug out from, you know, what, you know, this, this mythological thing that you, you know, you're, you've already got in your head and we just keep doing that. And the gorilla outfits get shittier and shittier and, you know, with each reenactment and all that. Um, and, so, so, uh, yeah, so what you're yeah. telling me is that, so what you're telling me, I mean, I was looking at this Bigfoot and I was saying, you know, it's similar, but the eyes are different. So I was wondering if it was like a, a little, you know a couple generations down. You know, they're a little yeah, different, no, but no. but what you're telling me is this is actually an actor in a suit, not the real Bigfoot. In in uh <laughs> in, in the movie or the Patterson Gimlin thing. Uh I'm saying in that photo right in that photo that I took off of your website where you say it's a stupid yeah. Bigfoot movie, you're telling me that that mm -hmm. you, you you didn't have the budget to hire the real Bigfoot. You had to get an actor in a suit. I hate to break it to you. This is, this might be some Hollywood stuff, you know, movie magic that blows your mind. I photoshopped that myself. <laughs> that is that oh, is Hollywood I was magic. So, That's Hollywood magic. I was so I thought you had real oh, no. evidence. I was yeah, watching this movie and I I looked at it now. as a yellow. Uh -oh. Yeah, we can still hear you. Are but you, we hear you fine, and we can see you fine too. Are yellow? You, yeah. You, did we lose you, Nick? Uh oh. It looks like he's texting you right now, JB. Nick, there we go. Yeah, okay, right. we still have you. Lost you for a second. Yeah, got a little lag there. Uh, a little lag there. Yeah, damn internet. Um, I have horrible, horrible internet where where I'm at. I'm in the middle of a city, and it's it's never good. But yeah, yeah. Uh, movie magic. I photoshopped that image myself of the uh, the Bigfoot in front oh. of high school. Well, I'm depressed. I'm sorry, I thought I'm... this was a real docu. I thought this was real evidence. I was going with it. 
All right. Well, then I got well, another question gotta... for you. Um. So so Austin, your uh, the person in your documentary, Austin. He yeah. He picks up this machete and he's gonna go after Bigfoot with a machete. I'm thinking that why is he thinking a machete would work better? Than the bag of groceries that are behind him on whatever that is, <laughs> shouldn't have he used the bag of marshmallows instead of a machete to win Bigfoot over as opposed to challenge Bigfoot? Um, you know, that's something that uh, first of all, that's Randy. That's the character of Randy. Um, oh, Randy. Yeah, so that was Austin. Randy. Randy's got some. Uh, Randy, you know, if you, when you watch the movie, Randy's got some. He's got some issues that are beyond you know, uh, Bigfoot obsession. I mean, it, his Bigfoot obsession and his desire to blow up Bigfoot, um, is a result of some pretty deep seated issues that he's got as a person, uh, kind of crazy conspiracy theorist, tinfoil hat wearing type dude. But, uh, but yeah, he's, he's got, that is, that is his mission in life is to blow up Bigfoot. He's not trying to win <laughs> him over. He's not trying to do anything except kill the shit out of Bigfoot. Well, I would I would like to submit another theory why Randy doesn't like Bigfoot is that there may be a love triangle going on. I got when I was watching a documentary, I got the vibe that Brandy May and Bigfoot had a thing going on, and maybe Randy's not into that. Is that possible? Yeah, um, yeah. So that that is Austin and, and Brandy May right there, and they did uh, they did purport to have a threesome with Bigfoot. They call it a menage a trois, just you know, to sound fancy, but, um, <laughs> mm. and, uh, and they're, they're a whole other thing. They're, um, they think Bigfoot's a loving creature. They smoke meth with him and they get into a threesome and there's dildo action and it, it gets pretty, pretty wacky, pretty quick. That's the first five minutes of the movie. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, we, we opened with a bang literally. And, um, <laughs> and yeah, and <laughs> There. That's why I quit doing stand up. Uh, there. <laughs> their Bigfoot threesome. Um, you know, it it does some things to them as a couple that you know, as the movie kind of goes along, they kind of have to deal with because uh, that's that's a lot. To, uh, that's a I lot. Mean, to, that's a lot to handle I, in a marriage. I mean, how does Austin compete with Bigfoot? I mean, it's Bigfoot. Bigfoot. Big yeah, yeah. hands, big. You know what you know? they say about the size of the foot. That's right. Right. Big ass. Exactly. <laughs> okay. No. Um, yeah. Big ass. There we go. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. No. And that's that's a uh, that's something. Yeah. There. There's this whole bit about how Brandy May's been reading all of these articles about how monogamy is a made up construct, you know, meant to enforce heterosexual, you know, uh, societal, societal norms, and it's a way to consolidate wealth and power and all of this. And you should really be, you can have a committed emotional relationship, but it's still valid to, you know, have multiple sexual partners and blah, blah, blah. And the joke is it made sense to Bigfoot right away. Now, Austin's <laughs> is a little more convincing, but he eventually came around. And, um, That's awesome. It's, uh, it's one of my, it's one of my favorite jokes in the movie. It's very stupid. It's God, this movie's so dumb, but, um, so dumb. It's yeah. funny. Yeah. I, okay, I well, still, I, uh, I've seen I, I have a clip here from the movie real quick, and then I'm going to ask you a question after we play it. Oh. Uh, do you need me to step out so you can... Um, Nick, that's, that's, <laughs> a, a, that's, 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 um, that's a lot of toys. Who, what production assistant did you send down to the store to buy... And what was the response from the clerk? So the our, our main hero dildo is this double-ended pink neon, you know, neon pink dildo. Um, thing did, was, did you say main hero <laughs> dildo? Is that what you just said? Yeah, that's our, our main hero. You know, it's like a movie term, like you know, like the uh, the hero car or whatever. You know, the, it's it's <laughs> okay. sort of the main one that the gotcha scene is it is based around but yeah that that main dildo uh i bought from a sec we were just kind of it was the end of summer of 2020 and we were just starting to get into pre-production i was like i gotta buy, i gotta find like the main thing you know the main uh dildo that they're gonna be swinging around and stuff at the beginning so i went to a sex shop and uh searched for like 45 minutes and i paid a lot of money for that thing 
And then the rest of the stuff on there is either my dog's toys <laughs> and also <laughs> the uh, the real, you know, because Brandy May and Austin in the movie, they're, they're played by an actual real life couple that uh, I, I went to I went to high school with with the guy who plays Austin and um, and I don't remember what she said exactly, but she showed up the day that we went. That was the first day of shooting was was all the, the crazy threesome stuff. And, uh, and she just had like this big McDonald's sack or whatever of these, of these smaller dildos that like stick to things. And she's like, yeah, a friend of mine brought these over and I never thought I would use them, but we can use them for this. Right. And yeah, so, like, yeah, 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 yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah, so half of, half of it was actual dildos and half of it was just my dog's toys. That was, that oh, was it's amazing thing. what you can make. When you blur stuff out, what you can innuendo it into. I just well, I, I saw that scene. Out, but I was gonna say even even without blurring it out, like one of my dog's favorite chew toys. I mean, it just looks like this big anal bee thing. It's crazy. <laughs> I, I never put so, that together. So do the toy, we, do the toys as they're displayed there? Do they have like chew marks on them from the dog? Yeah, and like <laughs> God, hair. God, I mean, it was nice. disgusting. That's it was nice. horrible. <laughs> it was, that makes it even better. And it's oh their actual God. bed, and I was. I was like, guys, is this okay? And they're like, yeah, they'll throw it all on it. You know, they didn't give a shit. I mean, I'm surely they wash their their sheets after that. But um, <laughs> yeah, we hope. But yeah, and actually, one of the one of the smaller dildos that like sticks, you know, you, has like a little suction cup on it. She actually suction cupped that to her husband's ass for one <laughs> shot, and it like and it stuck. It like stuck on his. It stuck on his ass really good. Oh, so I don't man. know who manufactured those uh, those suction cup dildos, but. It, Ace there job, they are. are. Wow, JB, we blew our G rating right out uh, of the no, water. Right out of the gates. <laughs> yeah, G was so, gone. Yeah, we never talked about it before. I don't know what we're allowed to say <laughs> on here, but uh, uh, whatever. Well. Yeah, I, I need to ask you a, a bit more of a serious question, Nick. Uh, we mm. talked about the Patterson Gimlin film. That's still kind of considered from 1967, 68, like the holy grail of Bigfoot images. Uh, what are your mm -hmm. thoughts of it as a professional filmmaker? I mean, people who are filmmakers can look and see different things, you know, whether maybe you can see it as being staged or you see evidence that it's not that it's not authentic or maybe you see that it is authentic. Do you have any opinion on it as a filmmaker? Um, so I'll say this. I think because I've been obsessed with that image, that footage, you know, uh, I mean, since I was born pretty much, it's aesthetically it is – you. You couldn't set out to, you couldn't create something more iconic than that if you tried. It's insane how to, because, you know, because the guy came out a few years ago, I remember, you know, finally saying, yeah, it was a hoax. It was just, you know, my buddy in a costume or whatever. And I filmed it. Um, I don't remember exactly which of the guys uh, came forward. I think it was but, Gimlin. Um, I think it was Gimlin. Yeah. And, you know, and like watching it, you can kind of, tell i mean it, it like it looks cool but it's also you know i mean it's bright sunlight and to me it kind of it it sort of looks like a guy in a costume but the the actual still frame you know that just has like lived in infamy i mean it's it's chilling it's haunting it, it just aesthetically i mean you just cannot create something more perfect than that if you wanted to and um so yeah, whether it's fake or not, who gives a shit? Because they gave the world what's going to be the definitive image of Bigfoot for forever. Yeah, I think that frame, the one you're talking about, which is that still where the arms are extended, the creature's walking, and its face is turned toward the camera. I think that's probably second only to the Zapruder film, like frame 232 of the Zapruder film. Yeah. I mean, as far as in pop culture yeah. goes, right? I mean, you probably agree with that. Oh yeah, no, I mean absolutely. It's um, and that's that's why we use it. That's why we keep you, you know, in the movie and all that because it. just, I mean, look at that. That just, I honestly, I could frame that and like hang it on my wall. I yeah. just love looking at that. It just and that's why you know, like that. That's the outline that we base kind of for our logo. You know, the elusive logo and all that. Um, it's just so you know you you don't have to do any work. And that was kind of the thing behind the whole movie is. You know, Bigfoot is sort of this mythological social thing. You know, you know, you throw a rock and hit a car with a Bigfoot bumper sticker on it, and so it's it's just not hard <laughs> to brand. You know, your 
what it is that you're doing. So when you set out to make this, uh, you know, you told us about how, you know, obviously you're looking for something to do that you could do during the pandemic and the lockdowns and all of that. You had a different project you had to put on hold because of all that. Were you setting out to make people laugh, to make a statement about Bigfoot, all of the above, none of the above? Um, yeah, definitely not a, definitely not. You know, I, I say there wasn't a statement because when we, because the way it, the way it sort of worked out, I mean, one, we did want to make people laugh. Um, my first sort of before Andrew, the co-writer, before he ever got involved, kind of really when I was just bouncing ideas around with uh, the other producers, uh, Chris Butcher and Steve Patchen, the last third of my version of it got a lot darker and like, I mean, like true horror, you know, cause I want, you know, cause my first impulse was like the first two thirds will be like straight comedy. And then it turns to like Halloween or whatever, uh, you know, in the last third and it gets like, you know, actually like really like messed up and serious. And then once we started writing it, we were like, you know what? It's because it, especially back in 2020, we're like, it was straight comedy. Stop trying to be weird. Stop trying to be, you know, David Lynch or whatever. Let's just make people laugh. And then as far as like, you know, a statement goes, and I don't want to get too pretentious about it, but as we were writing it and making it, um, the Jimmy character in the movie, you know, the guy who's, you know, the, the, the cameraman, the guy who's actually making the documentary, he was a lot of, you know, there was a lot of us in him, you know, because we all went, you know, every, just about everyone who made this movie, we all went to, to the same film school. And, uh, and there were a lot of students that we remembered from back in those days, you know, the delusional film student, uh, you know, who's going to change the world and they're going to whatever. And kind of through <laughs> that character, uh, through that character, we kind of started realizing the movie was kind of becoming a story about stories in a little bit, you know, a little bit. And, and even with the Wayne character and his whole father son thing, you know, he's, he's wanting to, you know, Bigfoot is his son's favorite monster. So he wants to, here's me going out to find Bigfoot. You know, he's, it's, it's storytelling of its own kind. And there's a lot of weird meta shit going on. And, and so when you get to the end of the movie, it, you know, I mean, there's, uh, you know, maybe there's some kind of stuff about like, what does narrative mean and all that, you know, kind of clanging around your head or you don't care. And you're like, well, the movie's done. It's time to you know <laughs> go eat a burger or whatever. But um, I never want to presume what an audience is going to you know think about something. But, uh, but as we were making it, we were all sort of talking a lot about like that, like, whoa, we made a story about stories in a weird way and kind of what more perfect sort of vehicle to use that than the story of Bigfoot, this mythology that we just kind of keep perpetuating, especially right now. I mean, Bigfoot is just such a part of the popular zeitgeist, you know, just the cultural zeitgeist mm -hmm. that um, it's a story that we're all sort of telling each other and we're all kind of involved with or whatever. You know, but, I, um, I find it pretty interesting that you mentioned that only because I've noticed and I haven't noticed it as much in the last, say, two or three months, and maybe it's just the season, but I noticed for a while there I'd be watching something, a program on television, and the ads would come on, and I'd see a constant barrage of Bigfoot representation in ads. You know, whether it's the beef, mm -hmm. the beef jerky ads. There's, I mean, there's been there's yeah. several uh, ads that rely on a Bigfoot type uh, creature or a direct reference to Bigfoot as a selling point in their ads. What what's that about? I think it's just because it's an easy, the same reason we made the movie, the same reason that we made Bigfoot the subject of the movie is uh, everyone knows about it. Your 90 year old grandma will understand, you know, ah, Bigfoot's the hide and seek champion of the world. You know, everyone yeah, right. gets that. And um, yeah, it's just, it's just an easy way to hook people and get people paying attention and you know it's 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 a joke we're all in on at this point and um and so yeah and so our movie i mean it, it doesn't really i haven't talked you know i haven't really spoken to anyone that actually like believes that they encountered bigfoot you know i you know i haven't come across any any of those folks yet I to talk to them our movie doesn't really lampoon that so much. I mean, it kind of does in the beginning, you know, because the first 20 minutes of the movie is kind of like a bad Unsolved Mysteries episode, the way it's cut and all the reenactments and stuff like that. <laughs> like the original, you know, Robert Stack Unsolved Mysteries. Um, it, you know, it kind of plays the whole thing as a joke. And then as the movie 
goes on without spoiling anything. It, it gets a little bit more, um, less making fun of it and more, here's a comedic version of if this actually happened, you know, because there are, you know, there are some, I'm not doing a very good job at selling this as a comedy, but there are some <laughs> kind of sad bits that happen sort of in the middle at the end. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, do you, you know do you, some kind of emotional stuff. Do you lampoon the the actual search itself, the people who maybe take the search a little too seriously? And the reason I ask is Britt and I in our work with ghost hunters and all the paranormal investigations we've done, investigations we've done with groups, we'll frequently chuckle to ourselves when we see how over the top some of these people are in their quote unquote investigation and everything is a ghost. Everything they see, touch, hear, smell, do is a ghost. Do you take that route? Um, yes and no. I mean, we didn't have a lot of money to do a lot of stuff, you know, so it's mainly just like the guy, like, you know, touching a tree and he's like, oh, I'm getting the four spirits or whatever. But I do, yeah. because I am interested in this. I want to ask you when you're on, you know, with those, cause I, cause I get, I get annoyed when I watch those ghost hunting shows and, uh, they spend fifty thousand dollars, you know, putting uh, security cameras and stuff all over an abandoned hospital or whatever, and then a mouse takes a shit and they all freak <laughs> out and leave. When you see those guys, when you see those guys doing all that crazy, over-the-top, dramatic stuff, is there a camera around, or is it just, just, just some people just kind of doing their thing, well, or do you think maybe? they're overdoing it just because you were there or whatever, you know, because I, because I'll watch those shows and I'm like, okay, they don't actually think people are buying this as like reality television. Do they, you know, well, because it is you've just asked, so, yeah, you've asked so many questions in a, in a very, in a short paragraph there. <laughs> just l let me just, let me just answer with what I was referring to specifically. I, we, Britt and I did yeah. a lot of events where we would invite fans of ghost hunters or just paranormal investigating to come to a location that ghost hunters had investigated in and spend the weekend with us and other cast members of ghost hunters and do an investigation a couple nights during the weekend. And those people mm -hmm. really, really got into it to the point where, you know, we would, we would, and we loved their enthusiasm for it, but we also knew it was just, you know, it wasn't what they thought it was. But yeah. that's okay. They had their experience, and that's what they came for, and that's all that counted. Now, Britt can talk a little bit differently about it, because when the cameras were on for the show, that's a different story than what I was talking about. Britt, I don't know if you want to address that. Um, well, I'm out of contract now, so they can't, they can't shut me up, but... But Nick, I was on Ghost Hunters. I was on air talent on Ghost Hunters from season four to season ten or something like that. Like nine years of my life. Mm -hmm. I look, you're you're in Hollywood. Well, I mean, even though you're in Oklahoma, you get it. And and I, I live in Hollywood and people look at me, come on, we know how Hollywood works. But Ghost Hunters was the original show. We had zero budget mm -hmm. and they didn't fake anything. We got stuff yeah. wrong. Don't get me wrong. There was stuff we got wrong. But a lot of the shows that came afterwards, which I won't name, just out of, you know, for whatever reason, but there's a lot of shows that came afterwards that were pretty big, and literally they would go and have their shot list and do their thing, and they would do two or three episodes at one location, and the next day production would show up and hand them, uh, and hand them their flash drive and go, this is what you found last night. So there are a lot of mm -hmm. shows that, uh, that it was just straight up BS, and it was, it was a show. Ghost Hunters was a little yeah. different, and it was. But if you watch the first season of Ghost Hunters, it was a thirteen-episode run, and ten episodes had nothing happen in it, nothing. Only like three episodes in that first season that had a uh, true, true activity in it. Now, yeah. me personally, I don't know what the hell we found. All I know is I experienced shit I can't explain. I mean, I, legitimately, yeah. there was Ghost Hunters when I was there wasn't fake. We didn't have the budget for it, even if we wanted to do it. Polygian was such a cheap tight ass, the guy who owned the production company, he would never let us do it anyways, because he didn't want to pay for it. But we figured out how to mm -hmm. make, you know, how to make exciting stuff, because where shit happens. And you know, Shh, you hear that? What's that? Act break. I mean, granted, it's the ice machine making a bunch of noise, but you, you know, you give the people the ride, and then you figure out it's the ice machine, and that's fair to do. But there were times, I shit you not, I heard something. We go in with it, and there, it's like, what the hell was that all about? I mean, I literally had a door open and then close on command. I mean, 
Going one way, I would understand a truck goes by, it vibrates, your door opens when you ask for it. There's a weird coinky dink, but it all lined up. But then to immediately go, if you really want to impress me, close it, and the fucking door closes? What the hell is that? So, yeah. I, from, from being yeah, on the show... <laughs> Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I, I was just gonna, I was just gonna say, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that, you know, because being on like the sort of granddaddy, the original, you know, show of, you know, because now, you know, they're kind of a dime a dozen, all these paranormal research, and I do yes. feel that sort of that bullshit thing from a lot of them. But yeah, but you know, back at the beginning when you're doing it, and you have no budget, and you're not trying to. You know, I mean, you have to shape stuff narratively, like you said, you know, act break, you know, like for commercials and shit. And you got to leave with a cliffhanger, you know, blah, blah, whatever. But but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned that because that is I don't know. That's I don't know where I'm going with any of this. That's my whole life. But um, <laughs> somewhat one Thank of you. us has a ghost on their on their front yeah, porch. Every time um, a bell rings, an angel gets his wings. That's what I heard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There we uh, go. Yeah. I don't now, know. I, you know, Watch oh, watch Kindred Spirits. Watch Amy Bruni's show, uh, Amy and Adam on Kindred Spirits. Amy's super straight up. That show, um, they don't they don't play. Amy's um, really adamant about not playing that. But all the other shows that are on right now, and I, don't get me wrong, I don't watch them anymore. I'm so burnt on it. I did it for you know ten years of my life. I was like, oh god, I want to throw up now. But uh, that's probably one of the best shows that's on right now. That doesn't play any yeah. shenanigans. So. If there's something happens, you're like, no way. Yeah, that that's just not in Amy's nature, and she's the executive producer of it, so she wouldn't let the shenanigans happen. All the rest of the shows, I can't vouch for, but well, and um, I think that's how it, it should right. be when you're, yeah, and, and I think that's how you know because the last, the last, you know, because when the pandemic happened, and uh, suddenly I was completely by myself for you know, especially after the movie wrapped. Um, you know, I get my son half of a week, and then the the other half of the week I'm just by myself. So like, you know, especially like December 2020 and kind of early getting early into 2021, I was just at home by myself, and so I just started doing a lot of reading and thinking and thought experiments about all like, okay, like you know, because I'm fascinated by like supernatural stuff and um, what is us, you know, psychologically, when are we being biased? When is there actually something? Is there some sort of uh, connective tissue in the universe holding all, you know, whatever? And, and, and I think any truly rational person, even if that's your job, I'm going to go find a ghost. You have to <laughs> be as judicious and... Yep. You know, you, you can't just, you know, every little thing that, oh, it's like, you know, you've, you, you've got, yep. I don't know. And, and it's kind of, I'm kind of like that with sort of any belief system. I mean, whether it's yeah, politics, absolutely. religion, whatever. I mean, you can't, it's so arrogant to me. And I think that's what kind of burns me with a lot of, you know, just, now we're getting into, you know, more than just, you know, ghost hunters or whatever, but just arrogance of, Oh, I've been astro projecting since I was six months old. I can do it. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. did you just have a weird yes. dream? You know, maybe you're having a weird, you know, I don't know. And that's the thing. I mean, you've got to be able to say, I don't know. There's, we understand 5% of the universe, 95% of what's out there. We don't know what it is. They're calling it dark no matter for right now because they just don't know. So I'm, you, you know, know who knows it. if... Yeah, it's 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 that mind boggling. And these are the smartest people that have ever been alive. Albert Einstein couldn't figure it out, for God's sake, you know. And so, so yeah, I don't. It's so on one hand, I'm like open to just about anything anymore, you know. I mean, aliens go, you know, whatever. But on the other hand, it uh, it it just bothers me when people are so, you know, militant atheists bug me as much as insane religious zealots they're both equally dangerous I agree 100%. that's why when i was on the show i used a lot of equipment if you ever watch the show man i there's one episode where i put out like 75 pieces of equipment because for me if i can you know the barometric pressure is steady it just is mm -hmm. it doesn't fluctuate a lot normally unless you got a tornado going overhead but i would hope you would notice the fucking tornado going overhead you know, the EMF yeah. field there is goes PG steady. 13. The, 
Oh, 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 yeah. Well, we already blew that out of the way with the dildo talk, so. That's true. Um, but for me personally, I would want to put the equipment out to document the environment, put a camera on it so it's visually documented, and put an audio recorder on in the area that's documented visually, and then I would step back and just observe with myself. And if I could get a, a weird thing that happens that affects everything, I see it, feel it, whatever, the equipment fluctuates, and the camera documents something moving, that to me is the best piece of evidence because I'm removing the human element from it, but I'm also experiencing it as a human. So I experience something that the equipment documented the environment going into flux for some reason, whether it's, you know, the temperature dropping or, you know, the, whatever, uh, a door opening and closing. If I can feel it, document it, and visually document it on video, that's what you kind of have to do. The other thing is that blows, that, that upset, that pisses me off is when, is when people go, oh, I got this crazy cool EVP. It said purple, orange, something. Well, what was the question that you asked? Oh, I don't know, but this is what I got. Well, if you don't, no, what you asked, and the, if you asked, is John here, and it says purple, that doesn't make sense. You got to throw that yeah. out, you know? Or if you go, yeah. John, why are you here uh, purple? What, what does that mean? But if John goes, well, in 1882, my house burnt down because my crazy dad set it on fire, and I burned up in the attic, and then you do your research, and you find in an 1882 newspaper that, you know, John Smith's home burnt down, the child died, that is a cool piece of uh, evidence, and that's a... What the hell was that? How, why is that on this recorder to point me in that direction to go research that and find all this information? Which has happened. What is that? Yeah. What is that? Well, I, keep, what, I don't know what it is, but what is it? Yeah, well, and that's kind of the fundamental issue with, I mean, kind of any sort of, you know, trying to be groundbreaking scientific research, but especially paranormal or supernatural stuff. There's not, it's not like there's a, there's a, that you can use to try to prove the existence of something that's coming from another plane of existence. You know, that's really, yeah. really hard to do. And, um, yeah, I don't know. I, what, I, I think it's your next the, documentary. A, yeah. Well, I, <laughs> I don't want to give anything away, but I think you'll be interested in my next, in my next movie. It's, it, it goes into a lot of this of, uh, how much of supernatural occurrences is actually that? How much is in our mind? Is there a line between the two? You know, what is all that? And um, hope, hopefully we'll be shooting it by the end of this year. But, Nick, uh, yeah, we'll, Nick we'll the, uh, the mockumentary style uh, of filmmaking mm -hmm. and, and uh, style of film, it's a real talent to be able to pull it off. Uh, there are some really good ones, but what are some of your favorites and you know maybe what are some of your favorite mockumentary filmmakers? Do you have any? Um, we talked a little bit about Christopher Guest when we were making this. We didn't want to get you know that that's an obvious easy answer. We didn't want to get too. I think the one of the, the starting was uh, the original Blair Witch Project, which yeah. I'm a huge fan of. Me I too. Still love that movie. Me too. Um, and we start we were you know we started. What's that? I threw up at Blur Witch. I watched 99% really well of Blur Witch. I, I, the, all the movement, I couldn't do. I watched 99% of Blur Witch like this. So for me, Blur Witch was all in my head. Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, I, would look, creepy. Yeah, I would look up and get a glimpse of what they're doing and then have to do this. So I had to make yeah. it up. So Blur Witch was a completely different experience for me, and it was really demented. <laughs> Yeah, well, in Blair Witch, it's because I, I think there's a difference between like mockumentary or faux documentary and found footage, you know, like a mockumentary or faux documentary. It's like the intention is we're making a documentary, whereas found footage, you know, some teenager had a camera and then they found it later. You know, it's so I, I think the two kind of get and, and I think that's one reason because we started off like oh, we're gonna make a, we're gonna make a comedy version of Blair Witch and that lasted all of five seconds because that movie <laughs> is just a kind of a different thing and um, even though I still love it and I still you know I've got a uh, where's my poster oh yeah I got a poster for it right over there but um, but in, in terms of because there haven't been a lot lately there's one there I, I think it's called. Lake Mungo. Oh, I've been I meaning love, to see I that. love Lake Mungo. It is one okay, of the best yeah, new horror films in the last 
10 years anyway. Maybe I don't remember, maybe it's 15 years old now. I'm not sure. But like at least 10 years. It's 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 great. Yeah. I I I I've been wanting because I heard like more than one person mention that. I I've, I've uh I I've, I've been meaning to get around to that. Um I I had some sort of kind of ethical issues with it, but M Night Shyamalan's The Visit I thought was interesting just because you know here's a guy that made all these big crazy blockbusters you know now going back to you know this like tiny little thing and seeing what he does with that i thought it was kind of gross that like yeah old people mental illness it's freaky right you know (laughs) it just it felt felt a little (laughs) exploitative but i still you know i think there was a lot because i remember seeing that in theaters opening weekend with a packed you know theater and i mean the last you know 10 minutes when the old guy's rubbing a diaper full of shit in the kid's face or whatever i mean it was just like whoa you know and 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 so that that that's always been kind of clanging around in in my brain and i do think it's a better movie than what a lot of history remembers it for but um but it but it's the last time i watched it i was like man this is really good but i just hate this sundowning dementia as as horror movie villain thing that that he's doing but um uh, you know, Spinal Tap is another easy one to uh, one one of the producers, Chris Butcher. I think that's I don't want to speak for him, but I think that's one of his favorite movies. Um, and if you what I can't I just can't think of a lot off the top of my head. And that was kind of the weird thing about this movie is there are a few little baselines, you know, like I was saying, like the Unsolved Mysteries uh angle and all that that we were like, yeah, this and then it just kind of became its own thing. Um because usually, you know, I the the movie I did before this, The Harvesters. I mean, it is a straight up rip off of Halloween and Jaws and all. You know, and I'm, <laughs> uh, you know, very uh, influences on my sleeve. But I don't know with this one for whatever reason, it was just kind of its own thing, and um, so we didn't look at a whole lot again outside of you know some of those you know the stupid bigfoot travel channel shows or whatever we watch those just to kind of get ideas or whatever kind of get the flavor but um but yeah tell me about some of the other people involved you've mentioned some names obviously you had, mm-hmm. you had a co-writer uh, andrew was going to be on couldn't be on last minute which is fine yeah. but uh you know who else was involved that you'd like to give some credit to everybody i mean yeah, I'll start with Andrew. He co-wrote the script with me, and uh, and really, I mean, he I'll, so much of the movie is is him. I wrote the first half, kind of everything leading up to like the first big reveal in the middle of the movie, and then I gave it to him and said, you know, go nuts. And he redid some stuff at the beginning, and then you know, we kind of had an idea of, you know, where the ending was going to go. And I mean, so much of the movie is him and he edited it and he did, um, you know, some really hideously complicated visual effects stuff like towards the end and sound design and blah, 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 blah. Uh, but, uh, Chris Butcher and Steven Patchen, they were the, they were the producers on it. Uh, they worked tirelessly, um, months before we shot, we're still all dying uh, right now as the movie is coming out and we're, you know, we're getting into theaters. It's on Vimeo right now. We're hoping it will be on Amazon by the end of May. Um, it's especially with our day jobs and stuff. It's just a ton of stuff to juggle, but you know, so we're all, you know, we're all getting pretty brain fried, but we're, we're sticking in there. We're, we're getting it done. Um, the cast, Brad, Chad, um, He's a local comedian, you know, local Oklahoma City comedian, and um, and he was actually one of the producer's ideas uh, because we were like less than a month away from shooting and we didn't have a lead, and it was getting pretty, you know, and it's like you can't cancel because we're all taking off work and some people are flying in and all, you know, and it's like, oh boy, what do we do? Mm-hmm. And... Uh, and one of the producers suggested Brad Chad Porter, who I sort of knew from, uh, you know, doing stand up and all that locally. He's he's kind of like the granddaddy of Oklahoma stand up comedy. Um, he's been doing it for a thousand years, and uh, but but he's also a, a really good actor. And so I said, okay, well, let's audition him because I wasn't really sold. He sent an audition. It was 
crazy how how good he was, you know. And it was like one of the scenes where it's like gets really uncomfortable and sad and weird and all that. And that's the one that we made him do. And he nailed that. He nailed the whole charlatan. I'm the Bigfoot. You know, I mean, there there's a lot of stuff that he has to do with his performance you know to to make it all work and it's and it's cra- and especially the way we shot it i mean there's times where the camera's just on his face for like three minutes straight and he just holds the screen and that wasn't you know i i didn't direct that that's just him you know just as a performer and it's because he's not really he's acted in a few little short things like 10 years ago but he's not like an actor actor and i think that's kind of why you know like with stand-up and all that he understands performing um uh i I think he like decades ago he used to be a preacher so he gets (laughs) you know having to stand up and be uh, (laughs) you know how to um you know have to have to perform something and so uh so you know on top of you know he's got his relationships with his two sons you know that are very you know melancholic and poignant and spe- you know as they're getting older and all that and that's kind of what the the sort of the drive and elusive is is um you know my son he's not going to believe in bigfoot for much longer so we got to rush 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 and you know try to prove the existence of bigfoot and uh you know and he he got all that he brought all that you know to the i don't know it was just it was just crazy and then I mean, the whole cast was great uh but the other the other guy i want to i want to point out is alex sanchez the guy who plays jimmy you know the del- the delusional documentary filmmaker and he kills it in a completely different way i mean it's the level of borderline sociopathy that this guy is displaying <laughs> yet you still go with i mean because he is a true you know i mean it's and you'll get it when you see the movie but yeah jimmy jimmy sucks in a lot of ways but <laughs> but the way the way that alex sanchez played him was just i don't know it's it's it was just sublime i he's um the guy the guy's got he's he's got he's got a real knack for acting and i hope he can i'm actually wanting to cast him in the lead for for my next thing he's got this kind of almost like richard dreyfus thing from the you know mid 70s he just kind of i don't know there's just something about him that, that that's really cool um and like i said the whole cast i mean just across the board everyone was was amazing uh the composer jonathan paulson was great the soundtrack is actually out now you can buy it um the producers i mean just look at it on an imdb any name that's on there they deserve all the praise in the world because everyone just just kicked ass on this thing our dp matt bowski did a great job um even the first ac uh his name's cole rochelle and he's very shy and he'll never see this so he doesn't know that i'm saying his name anyway but you know because <laughs> we're shooting the we're shooting this thing documentary style out in the woods and he's, you know, adjusting focus on the lens next to the camera. And it was just crazy how like the camera would run up to something and he would be able to just, I mean, it's, 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 you know, he's like a Hollywood pro, even though he doesn't really do that for a living. I mean, he works in video for a living, but not movies. He really only comes to do a movie for us when, when we do one, but, but like the amount of the movie that's in focus, especially like with the lenses that we were using and the camera that we were using, it uh, it's 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 not something that most people would ever give a shit about. And I, I you know, they're they're just there to watch a movie. I get it. But just as a filmmaker and all, you know, just me watching it and it's it's I'm pretty impressive it. technically. Nick, What's up? Nick, um, uh, first a couple things quickly. I want to thank Jade to Dank in our Foxhole chat for the contribution. Thank you so much for that. Nick, we're going to play the trailer now of the film, yeah. uh, the one that's publicly available. And uh, afterward, I want to ask you what your favorite moments of the trailer are, uh, just so you can comment on that. Just want to prepare you for that. So go ahead, Britt, if you've got that ready to go. This thing, this creature, for generations has only existed in our waking dreams and our collective imagination but i want to show beyond a shadow of a doubt that what some people say is impossible can be real all you have to do is look hard enough 
My name is Wayne Nicholson. I've hunted down everything from the Loch Ness Monster to the Jersey Devil. And now I'm here to find the mother of all unproven creatures. By listening only to the most credible witnesses. We got guns, you pew. We got knives, swing, swing. We got dynamite, boom, boom. And getting the most ironclad testimony. So it says, Sharon, your first name or your, your last name? Yes. We can prove once and for all that the impossible can be real. And it deserves to be taken seriously. We done had ourselves a menage a trois with Bigfoot. Ooh. Oh. Hey, hey folks, Jimmy here. If you're like me and you're fluent in the language of cinema, then you'll have noticed by now that something seems a little off about Wayne. This is where we make fire. <laughs> I am going to make a documentary within Wayne's documentary, documenting who Wayne is and whatever uh, the hell he's up to. No more lies, America. Sometimes the truck won't start. <coughs> so you grease the wheels. This is about my son. And make a movie for my son. I'm gonna prove to my son that magic can be real. He's just out here, you know? Trying to make a Bigfoot movie because he loves his son. You almost have to respect that. Almost. Bigfoot loves corn nuts. I just want my son to look me in the eye again. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm talking about, baby! Wayne and Jimmy on the case, saving the day, finding Bigfoot, making our son proud! Ugh, this, dude. You can have that little on the weekend. Yeah, I'm gonna go to the movies. 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 Yeah, I'm gonna go So you saw there the there website. You go. Yeah, the website is stupidbigfootmovie.com. There's so many there's so many clever and funny moments just in the trailer alone. But what are your favorites, Nick, that we just saw? Yeah, that that was kind of a tricky. This is a hard movie to advertise. Normally when I start a movie, uh I have the trailer in mind a year before I start outlining the script. Um, this was because it's a mockumentary. I mean, there are scenes where the camera's just set up and it will go on for three minutes and there's not a lot of action. You know, it's really hard to cut a movie out of that. So the, I'm really, really pleased with, with how the thing came out. I, I think it's kind of a subtle joke, but when he's saying like, I'm going to prove my son that magic can be real. And like, but what you're seeing is the camera comes around the corner and he's just like smoking a cigarette yeah, right. on the side of the house, right. like a sad old piece yeah. of shit. You yeah. Know, yeah. That, yeah. That, uh, yeah. Right. That's, I don't know. That, that makes me laugh. I think like viscerally the coolest moment is, um, right. It kind of right at the beginning when, uh, you know, you think it's still being serious and he's like, oh, the impossible can exist. And it's, you know, it, all you have to do is look hard enough. And like the camera's sort of going around a tree and right as you see a leg start to come out, it like cuts, you know, cuts to the logo and, you know, you hear the monster screaming and all that. That still kind of gives me a rush. Um, the shot where he's, we, we always called it our, our Clark Griswold moment. It's when he's trying to, he's like throwing the rope up yeah. at the tree yeah. and yeah. it goes on a lot. It goes on a lot longer in the movie. And he just kind of, I think just sort of made that up. I think in the script it was written, you there's like a close up of, you see him tying a rope to a tree and getting ready to swing. And then it cuts to a wide and it's like this little shitty little Creek. And he, you know, I mean, it's, <laughs> it was kind of the joke, but when we got there, we didn't really have that, but there was this big, huge like 30 foot wide uh cre i mean just this you know real like and it's like 20 feet deep and you like look over the cliff it's like there's no way like what is he doing and so you have that and then you have him just throwing a rope at a tree and just not i mean it's just so sad how much this guy is not going to survive out in the wood you know <laughs> and 
and the way the way he just kept throwing it, I don't know. It just it just made us laugh when we were shooting, and um, and a lot of the behind the scenes stuff. I mean, you can just hear the crew laughing. You know, just at the shit that they would do because the movie was pretty tightly scripted, and I don't really like a lot of improvising if if we can help it. But these are funny people and they're talented people, and so you know if if we had a little time or whatever i would just i would just let them riff and that that one always makes me laugh just that image of the guy throwing a just throwing a rope at a tree like it's going to do anything yeah. um yeah that, that always kills me and when he's when he's beating one rock on another rock trying to start, start, a, start fire. a fire yeah. yeah that was hilarious yeah 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 it's very very stupid uh before we, i ask you the, <laughs> go ahead go ahead nick Oh, I was just going to say, we got the stupid folks. That's me being a terrible salesman. <laughs> um, before I ask you, and I know you kind of touched on it where people can see it, Britt, do you have anything uh, you want to ask before we end this? No, no, I'm golden. I mean, okay. I mean, I want to ask nerdy stuff like the cameras they use, the lights, you know, how big was the crew, but that's not for... Yeah, uh, that's a different program. <laughs> Black Magic Camera crew is okay. very small. The black magic camera was badass. We had never, uh, I, I, I'd been interested in it for many, many years. And then finally the with this one, we we're like, it's, it's yeah. And I, I don't remember the exact like model and all that. Um, I'm not that technically proficient, but I, I loved what the camera was able to do. And I've never, sh I've never shot a movie raw before and i've never shot a movie 4k before and it was i mean <laughs> it was just nuts yeah speaking of people that deserve a shout out david mcintyre he was uh he did he did many things on the movie he was the behind the scenes uh photographer he did a bunch of sound work like cleaning but he was also our colorist and he color corrected oh. and yeah, and so yeah, that, uh, the the shit that the Black Magic gave, and we color corrected in Da Vinci, which makes the Black Magic camera, and, and it was it was beautiful yeah. what the the stuff we were able to get. And crew was incredibly small, um, way smaller than you know it was it was just nuts how. But uh, but everyone everyone did like eighteen jobs, and we shot it in seven days. I mean, it was just a crazy free for all when when we were making it. But, and they're done that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do have a question. I, I have, I do have a question. Um, so you're out, you're out in Oklahoma, so like the Tulsa area, which is kind of you're not. I mean, you personally are in the city, but in, in where you're at, you drive five minutes. You're in the middle of nowhere, right? Yeah. Well, I I live in I, I live in a suburb of Oklahoma City. Um, but yeah, I mean, I drive five miles east, and I'm at a lake and there's big woods and there's all, you know, cause especially cause Oklahoma, everyone kind of thinks of it as like, yeah, it's prairies and stuff like that. But really the whole East side of the state is woods and it's creepy. And especially in Southeast Oklahoma, there are entire towns that are dedicated to like Bigfoot shit and all, you know I mean? So it's, it's a very, um, it, to well, topographically it's, it's varied, but. Very, but my question, my question for you was going to be, have you ever seen anything in the sky UFO wise? I mean, since you're, I mean, I live in LA, so I, I have yeah. no, there's too much light pollution here. But you're out in the sticks where you can see some weird shit in the sky. Have, have you seen anything out there? Ah, uh, not really. There, there have been many, many nights where I've, uh, you know, driven around at midnight listening to the Close Encounter soundtrack, hoping that I'll kind of yeah. look up and see <laughs> something. Um, I never, I never it really. It's stupid. Have. We're doing butt stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, w I will tell you, maybe the clearest sky I've ever seen in my life was uh, the last movie we shot, The Harvesters. Um, there was a couple of nights where we shot out at this really creepy old abandoned farmhouse that hadn't been used in like 60 years and all that. And I mean, it's like truly, it's it's about a, uh, about an hour south east of, of the city. And... Um, there's like no electricity out there. The closest gas station is like 20 minutes away. I mean, it was like truly out in the middle of nowhere. And so at like four in the morning or whatever, when we got done shooting, the sun's going to start coming up in like an hour. We're breaking all the equipment down. All the lights are off and there wasn't any moon. There weren't any clouds. And I mean, you could see to the other side of the galaxy. And I will never forget the few of us that were left, you know, packing up the the last of the gear um 
one of the electricians he's like really into you know astronomy and stuff like that and he was able to say like oh this is that constellation and that's that star you know whatever and uh that was uh that was one of the most memorable uh, the most memorable like you know just looking up um kind of moments that, that, that i've ever had but yeah in terms of ufos not so much but you can get really because I, I love movie scores i listen to movie scores all the time and uh so I'll drive around, you know, at night. Um, that's kind of how I relax uh, if I don't have my kid. Um, I'll drive around at night and, like, listen to, like, the Shutter Island soundtrack or The Witch or whatever, you know. And it, it gets spooky, especially, you know, because I'm in the suburbs. But, you know, like you said, five minutes east and it's, you know, old rickety bridges. And, you know, it's when you kind of start getting into, like, the hills and the, and the woods and all that. So, but, yeah, no, no UFOs yet. Nick, where can people okay. see the film? I know you said that it's you're working on getting it on Amazon Prime. Uh, mm. It's on Vimeo. Just tell me how people can find it. Yeah, uh, stupidbigfootmovie.com is the easiest way to, if, if, if you forget everything else, go to stupidbigfootmovie.com. You can find anything that you, that you need there. Um, we're... we're putting it in theaters as we can. So like if you're in Tulsa right now, uh, it's going to be playing at the circle cinema for a week starting tomorrow. And we're doing, you know, tomorrow being uh, Friday, April 29th. And on Saturday, April 30th, uh, at the seven forty showing, we're doing a big Q and a and a big, you know, crazy, you know, thing, whatever. But yeah, for most people, it will just be for now, uh, on Vimeo, which again, yeah, stupid Bigfoot Um, it's not the, best most perfect way ever to watch you know it, vimeo can kind of be a little sticky sometimes but it works and you know and, and many people have watched it that way so far but yeah once we get it on amazon and all that it'll be a lot easier for people to see and uh while you're at while you're at stupid bigfoot movie.com if uh, we got a merch page if you want a t-shirt a bigfoot loves corn nuts t-shirt that's been our big our best seller so far um and coffee mugs and hats and all sorts of shit. But um, but yeah, yeah. Bigfoot, stupid Bigfoot movie dot com is the the easiest way to uh, to watch it. And if you want to keep, uh, we've got a Facebook, uh, which I think is Facebook dot com slash stupid Bigfoot movie. The Instagram is you know at stupid Bigfoot movie. So there's all sorts of ways to kind of keep up with with what's going on. But um, but yeah, the website's definitely the easiest. You hinted that the next film, the new the, your next project, is something we're also going to be interested in. You didn't really give us yeah. much information. Is there anything more you can tell us before we let you go? Uh, straight up horror film, okay. and in the vein of like the exorcist or, or whatever um that deals with how much of ghosts is real and how much is all in our heads and what does all of it mean but that's all i'm going to say for now but yeah hopefully hopefully <laughs> you know in a year year and a half we'll uh i'll get to talk to you guys about it that sounds perfect nick thanks so much for being here and sharing your passion for filmmaking in addition to uh what sounds uh, like a terrific film and I'm, I'm encouraging folks to check it out in the places that you uh sent them particularly going through the website vimeo until it gets elsewhere but thank you for sharing all of that with us tonight thank you for having me this has been a lot of fun i, I love doing this stuff you guys you guys are a lot of fun to talk to I'm be Thank happy to happy to come back again anytime you want me. Terrific, and give you, give our best hey. to uh, Andrew. What, Britt? What you gonna? What? Can, hey, Nick, can you write a part into your next movie where you where I get to kill JV really horribly what? and bloody? What? Lee? Sure. <laughs> we'll do a short film. Why not? It doesn't even have to have a story. It's just gonna be like <sighs> a. People are gonna watch it and it's like, is this a snuff film? What? Yeah. There's nothing here. Except this brutal. Yeah, we'll do it. Brutal yeah. killing. Brit's fantasy series. I'm a sociopath. I don't, I don't feel anything. So I, yeah, I'll just, I'll just set up a camera and you just kind of do whatever. No. We'll all be in the paper a year from yeah, now. Yeah, right. All right, Nick. Hey, thanks, buddy. There thanks for go. being here. We appreciate your time, my friend. Thank you very much. It's been a lot of fun. Okay. What is this? Is this something it. you think about a lot, Brit? You think about bloodily or murdering me in the most horrific way? Is that something that you often think about? <laughs> what are you what yeah uh, i don't know what what do you do I, I can't hear you my ifb died yeah what? yeah, I don't, yeah the I don't audio's dead you. yeah yeah I, I, yeah <laughs> 
man. You're True muted colors. Me. I can't hear you. True colors. Oh, my God. Holy cow. No, but how cool would that be to have a bit part in some movies where we just get killed horribly? I think, I think it'd be like, uh, you know how in, in, again, a South Park reference, how Kenny always dies? We should yeah, be in a series exactly. of like uh, movies, you know, where we just, there's always just a scene where one of us kills the other or one of us dies or whatever, you know, kind of a, a, a standing joke uh, uh, that spans a lot of yeah. different movies. That would be great. Well, there was a, I got the ideas from, uh, I don't know if you guys ever had Mark and Brian on your side of the country. They were, they were local LA uh, duo morning talk show shtick, but it was, they, because there's so much film here in LA, they were always doing curious, they were always a curious onlooker. That's what they always want to be. So they're in a lot of movies as just a curious onlooker one and curious onlooker two. What made me think of it was that you love horror and I love gore. Yeah. So if we can get into a bunch of these, a bunch of these, movies uh as just being killed that'd be amazing <laughs> so we would be the curious killies oh because we have time for that but that'd be fun it would be fun yeah exactly it would well, be you a know. Lot of fun. yeah uh, there is that time yeah yeah remember the uh the website uh we're being asked in chat what was the website again it's stupidbigfootmovie.com and there you'll get information uh to find the film watch the film check it out uh, I did not have a chance to watch it ahead of time, but I'm anxious to watch it now after the discussion. I watched the trailer yeah. and read a lot about it, but uh, yeah, it's it looks like it's just so much it's so much fun, and I really do appreciate when people can look at the lighter side of what we do as it relates to the paranormal, whether it's Bigfoot, ghosts, UFO, yeah. whatever. When we start looking at the lighter side of this, and we can kind of laugh at ourselves a little bit, or you know, I've never been Bigfoot hunting per se, so I'm not laughing at myself here, but I've seen people doing it, and I laugh at them too because I'm like, wow, you guys go through a lot to 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 find a strand of hair that you can't you can't prove is anything, and because you can't get the I yeah, don't know, you know, it's kind of interesting. But let's be honest, JV, a, a lot of it is just it's just it's a reason for people to have a group of friends to get out of the house to go do something together. I mean, that's their focus. I mean, some people do, you know, river kayaking. Some people you know, do they, they travel, they do the cruise circuit. You know, we used to do the ghost hunting stuff. Right. So, you know, so it's just a reason to get together and have a good time. And, you know, if you get lucky and you find Bigfoot, hell, you're going to be a rich person or dead. I don't know which. Yeah. So Smitten Kitten in our Foxhole chat is saying, how did I get here? LOL. <laughs> so I know, I know you uh, stumbled I, I, into something, I think. <laughs> Yeah, well, well, but she says she's going to come back, and she seems to like what we're talking about. So. Oh, cool. That's good. That's good. Uh, what else? Um, do we, so I, I don't know. We at cover, least I think so. We covered the drinking blood thing with uh, Megan Fox. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I, whatever any, that was all about. Any, anything else we need to address, oh. or oh, we, have we covered it all? No, I think we're good. Yeah. I think we're good. It's 8.17. It's time for me to get my milk and cookies and go to bed. Yeah, Smitten Kitten is talking about uh, having a big Bigfoot encounter. Uh, my encounter was totally accidental, dark, and in the middle of the night, nothing around, was in my car driving around with a friend. Yeah, that's the way it usually happens, and you don't have a camera available. That's the problem. You know, by the time by yeah. the time you, you get your camera up or whatever you think about it, the, the whatever it is is gone. Uh, Scooter reminded me we have to do a few trivia questions. Oh, that's right. And also, we might as well mention uh, our merchandise page. We do have a merchandise page. Yeah. It helps support uh, JV and I and all this. I mean, this software costs money, and this is, I mean, it, it actually, is. I had it. I just had to do my taxes. The amount of money I spent last year on this, holy crap, I had no idea how much I was spending, and I know you spend more, JV. But it helps us. So if you go to, if you go to, if you go to paranormalirl.com, paranormalirl.com, uh, there is a merchandise button on there, and if you can buy a T-shirt too, that helps us out and gets you a cool T-shirt. We got ghosty stuff and uh, ghosty stuff and UFO stuff and other paranormal stuff there. Coffee mugs, thong underwear, you know, stuff like that. What kind of underwear? Uh, thong underwear for you. No, I don't think so. I don't think we do have that. Um yeah, mm -hmm. check out the merch. Merch. We encourage you to uh, to uh, support us that way. It's a great way you get a shirt, and it's fun. Uh, ready for some trivia? I guess. Make me look stupid. Okay. Here we go. First question. What European capital city has the motto, Contemnit Procellus? That's it. Contemnit Procellus, which means it defies the storms. What European capital city has the motto, Contemnit Procellus? meaning it defies the storms. I don't know the name of the city, but it's in Morocco. In Morocco? Do you have a reason for saying it's, that? It's a, it's a, 
Uh, because Morocco's like on the Black Sea or something. It's on one of oh the seas. Oh my god! So it's on assuming. one of the sea. It's on one of the seas. He says, <laughs> <laughs> "The Black Sea is where he went first, which is no, it's not anywhere near the Black Sea. No, it's not. It's no, on the Mediterranean it's the, it's the Sea. It's the sea down by the boot. <laughs> the yeah, there we go. The Mediterranean. <laughs> oh sea. That's my what I'm god! For. Oh, uh, you know, I'm thinking it's going to be maybe like it could be Sicily. Sicily's not a city. Sicily's it's an a country, island. But whatever the capital no, of Sicily is. Sicily is part of Italy, which is an island. It's not a city oh. nor a country. It's part of Italy. I'm thinking it's, but the it might be a Nordic. There. Yeah, they are. Sicilians are from there, but it is part of Italy. I'm thinking it might be a Nordic country. Oh, you might you might be right. Yeah, all the Vikings. I don't and think shit there are and... really, really major storms that rip through the Mediterranean Sea because it's, you know, kind of kind of uh uh, landlocked almost. I mean, there's a little the Straits of Gibraltar. Yeah, I guess maybe you're right. So I don't think. Uh, I think it's got to be something yeah. on the Atlantic, uh, the no, North I, Atlantic I, I think specifically. The, I think the Nordic... You know what's crazy is all these Viking movies that are out now, and it's the Danes and the Finn. I mean, it's, it's that whole area was so violent. Yeah. And now they're like so peaceful. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's just crazy how that that how they made that change. And is it because all the violent people they killed off, so their genetics kind of skewed more to the pacifist side? Because all the violent, the violent side <laughs> killed each other off? I don't know. Just weird out nah, I don't know. But I do I think, know, I, I'm thinking that maybe uh, Edinburgh, Scotland, that would be a seemingly uh, harsh place. That's where my, my nephew is right now, actually, going to school. Mm. Uh, or it could be, see, I don't think it, like, I'm thinking in Norway, you know, um, I don't think so because uh, the capitals of Norway and Sweden are kind of tucked in. They're not on on the on the North Sea side. Yeah. So I don't know. Okay. So what do we have for answers? We've got uh, Lisbon, Rome, um, Rome, Naples, um, Athens, Galapago, Galapagos, uh, Iceland. Yeah, Reykjavik, Iceland was someone that came to mind for me. Um, okay, so let's see. The question was, what European capital has the motto, Contemnant Procellus, it defies the storms? The answer is Warsaw. <laughs> Warsaw what? isn't even on a uh, war. I guess the storm, by storms, they mean wars because it is, uh, Warsaw has been conquered so many times. Warsaw, the capital of Poland, the motto testifies to how the city has survived periods of conflict and war throughout history, including World War II. All right, well, that makes sense. If it's not storm, uh, literally, it's storm uh, uh, relating to war. That was a trick question. Wow, we got duped on that. All right. Yeah, I'm going for trick question. Next question. Oh, Where in the world can you find the Alhambra, a famous Islamic palace that dates back to the 13th century. Where in the world can you find the Alhambra, a famous Islamic palace that dates back to the 13th century? Hmm. I'm going to go with Syria. Okay. You're not going to go with Morocco this time? No, not Because it's on the Black Sea or one of, the, one of those seas over there? There's one, one of the seas over there. <laughs> It'd be the Orange Sea for all I know. The Orange Sea. Uh, we have answers coming in. We've got Israel. We've got Turkey. We've got Saudi Arabia. We've got not of Bigfoot. Oh, that's a different, that's a different thing. Galapagos. Those are islands. <laughs> Those are islands. The Galapagos islands. Yes. Once again, the question, where in the world, I have no can, idea. where in the world can you find the Alhambra, a famous Islamic palace that dates back to the 13th century? Ask Obama. <laughs> I don't. That's funny. Oh my god. <laughs> uh, Damascus. Uh, Why can't we get questions like "Look who sung"? Look, who, uh, like who sung? Look what the cat dragged in. Yeah, it's a good question. Jerusalem. I just know. I just wanted Brit to say it again. I know it is funny having Brit hard <laughs> words for Brit. So it's a good one. All right. Yep. Question is, where in the world can you find the Alhambra, a famous Islamic palace that dates back to the 13th century? Our answer is, the Alhambra sits on a hill overlooking Grenada, Spain. It is considered a masterpiece of Islamic architecture. So Interesting. Spain would be the answer. Never would have guessed that. Yeah. All right. You got a two for Scooter because the next one, which would have been a third, is a two. Weekend thing. Here we go. Oh, you're breaking up for me. What's that? Here we go. 
Um, first question. Here we go. How many hours does the average adult cat sleep daily? How many hours does 15. the average adult cat sleep daily? You're saying 15? No, actually, I'm changing that. I'm going to go with 18. 18? Okay. 18 hours, the average adult cat. Uh, okay. Lola says 23. Yeah. You got 23. Lola says 20. 20 mm-hmm. 16, 12, 13. 14. Uh, to answer the question, I wonder why it's in Spain. Uh, Spain has a long history of the Moors, which were an Islamic tribe, basically, invaded Spain in the uh, um, early second millennia and conquered a good portion of it. They conquered much of Spain. Spain has a tremendous amount of Islamic heritage there in its architecture. Uh, a lot of its uh, buildings of antiquity are, are, are uh, Islamic in nature. So they're eventually thrown out. Yeah, the Moors. They, yeah, it's it's pretty an amazing. It's an amazing history. Okay, how many average? How many hmm. hours does the average adult cat sleep daily? We've got a range of what twenty three to twelve. Looks like the lowest number on here. Over in Foxhole, 12, 20, 11. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. What did you say? 50? You went from 15 to 18? Where'd you go? I said, I went 18. I'm okay. going 18. Your, your original answer was 15, though, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. The answer to the question is almost or about 15 hours. However, some sleep, wow. up, to, some sleep up to 20. And how do I get that job? <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right, here's our final question of the night. Uh, and I can't pronounce it. This is a hard word for JV. Trompe le oil. <laughs> trompe, <laughs> trompe le oil is a style of painting. What does the French phrase trompe le oil mean in English? <laughs> Come on. Why do they make me read such crazy words? Uh in English, it translates to cheese croissant. Cheese croissant? Yes. Wouldn't well. that be fromage croissant? Isn't croissant yeah, itself a French word? Could be. <laughs> it is. Trompe it it means oil. buttery pastry. Trompe l'oil is a style of painting. What does the French phrase trompe l'oil mean in, in English? <laughs> <laughs> Rebel's asking if you can show the spelling. Yeah, okay. So it's I can't show it because I can't. The camera's farther away than it used to be, but I will spell it. It's T R O M P E, trompe, and it's le oil, which is L apostrophe O E I L, L apostrophe O E I L, trompe le oil. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, that's, that's fucking it. hilarious. No, it's Trump, uh, I, I, I can spell. I'm going to spell it here. It's Trum, Trumpe, Le, Ole. There it is. I just put it in the chat room. I'm going to put it in the other chat too. Over here. Yeah, that's that's pretty much it. There it is. Trumpe Le. le, le, le. What did you say it is, Britt? Is that a cat's ass behind you? What is that? Oh, uh, that was just my arm. That, it looked like a, it literally <laughs> looked like a cat's tail. Not now. It doesn't now. Oh, how funny. But it literally looked like a cat's tail. <laughs> you know, the cat's in the house. And she sleeps like 15 to 18 hours a day. Yeah, exactly. All right. So we have watercolor. Uh, Flowers and oil paint, oil of triumph, oil paint, um, painting with orange only. Yeah, it did. Lala says it really did no look idea. like a cat, like a cat's ass. Oh, look at him! Look at this struggle! <laughs> look at this struggle! Uh, I'm tired. It was a long day. Okay, uh, well, yeah, I'm not going to read the question again. The answer is because I can't read those words. The answer is. Deceives the eye. Trompe Eloile paintings deceive the viewer into seeing a three-dimensional object often through photo often through photorealistic detail. Did you get any of that, Britt? 
Uh, uh, your pronunciation of this deceived my ears. Trump. <laughs> yeah, once again, it deceives the oh eye. Oh, my God. Uh, these paintings deceive ah. the viewer into seeing a three-dimensional object, often through photorealistic detail. Oh, boy. I'm dying. I'm trying yeah, to go I can see, the camera. I can see you dying. Yeah. All right. So, again, th thanks, everybody, for joining us tonight. Thanks for hanging out for extra long for the... Uh, trivia portion of the program please visit the website and click on the merch page scroll down there's a lot of stuff there uh, we're adding stuff all of the time so keep checking it out we're gonna have a bigfoot uh, shirt up here re really soon um, but in the meantime just go to uh, p uh, paranormalirl.com click on the merch menu item or, or just add merch slash merch to the web address you'll get there too and uh, thanks for supporting us that way and we will see you on our next program, whenever the heck that is. Have a great night. <laughs>